So what's good, TMG fam? It's your boy Ellen. I'm back with another reaction. How y'all feel? Welcome back to the channel. Salute. So, next video. Three decades old cases, cold cases, solved in 2021. So, check it out. We ain't got to put on our investigator hats. The cases are solved, but we still want to check them out, man. So, we're going to get into this video. Shout outs to Merc Docs. Make sure y'all go show them a lot of love and support and subscribe to their channel. Make sure if you're new here, you hit the subscribe button. If you want to see more cold cases, unsolved or solved mystery stuff like that, give that thumbs up, man. Just hit that like button, all right? And um, let's get to it. Born on the 4th of July, Maureen Brubaker Farley was always jokingly described as a, quote, firecracker. The eldest of seven, Maureen was often put in charge of her younger siblings and watched over them with pride and care. Oldest of seven. Seven. Sometimes her parents, knowing the amount of stress she was bound to endure when left alone with her six siblings, offered each one a bribe. Marine's mother would give each younger child 10 cents apiece, a hefty sum in the 1960s, in exchange for their promise to mind their manners for their eldest sibling. Marine was born and raised in Sioux City, Iowa. Marine moved to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, in order to be geographically closer to her new husband, David, who was serving time in the Anamosa State Penitentiary. With the cost of making a phone call to her family being sometimes fiscally imprudent, Maureen would take care to mail pictures of her life back home to her four brothers and two sisters, who, along with their parents, eagerly awaited any news of the eldest child. Living on her own and working in Cedar Rapids, Maureen was impressing everyone with her ability to keep her life on track, despite impediments. Maureen was last seen alive at 5.30 p.m. on Friday, September 17, 1971. After she uncharacteristically neglected to show up for her shift at the diner she worked for, a local joint named Vida's Restaurant, located at 836 First Avenue Northeast, and later neglected to pick up her paycheck, her boss reported to her authorities as missing. On September 24, 1970... So that, like... <laughs> That, that was a definitely something was wrong. That was a definite red flag right there. A person who's struggling, hasn't picked up their paycheck or shown up for work, definitely a red flag. And if you don't think people you work with know you're struggling, trust me, they, they know, they see, they can tell, they can pick up on little things. Boss reported to her authorities as missing. On September 24th, 1971, two teenage boys out hunting and exploring the area approached the trunk of what they believed to simply be an abandoned, dilapidated vehicle. Kevin Coppus, 15, and Danny Lineweaver, 14, first saw what they believed was a sleeping woman. They thought she was resting because of how she was positioned across the trunk, mm. with one of her legs propped up and her back perched against the rear window. Not wanting to disturb the woman, they continued on their way, but on their walk back home, they decided to make a closer inspection, and that's when they realized the true horror. They saw her sitting in the same probably position she was in when they first saw her, and that probably tipped them to think, maybe she's not sleeping, such that they had to come across that, though. The two boys approached the car and realized the sleeping woman was actually the lifeless body of 17-year-old Maureen who had been carelessly thrown atop the car's trunk. The grisly discovery was traumatic for all involved. Babies finding babies, the locals lamented. Three children, in essence, all exposed to trauma far beyond their years. Her body had been stealthily stowed in a wooded ravine located off of Ellie Road Southwest, near the local dump in what is now Tate Cummins Park. The medical examiner ruled that Maureen's body had been there for, quote, no less than 48 hours and no more than 96 hours. She was partially undressed and was shoeless, but investigators noted that she had clean feet, which police said was evidence that Maureen's body had been moved post-mortem. Her cause- 
That's the first first time I've ever heard that as far as for post-mortem goes. Clean feet sometimes indicates that a body has been moved. Hmm. And remember, they said she was found partially dressed. So she was definitely probably attacked and you, you know where I'm headed with that. Cause of death was a basal skull fracture, Whoa. a crack in the base of her skull caused by a brutal blunt force trauma to the head. Autopsy results also showed that she had been sexually assaulted. With Maureen's life cut short. Yeah, her being partially dressed gave that part away, but the, the skull damage? That seems a little bit personal. Somebody was that angry to do that? Or maybe did she fight back and the person, you know, during the scuffle grabbed something and hit her over the head with it? Uh, that, that, that throws me off right there. That seemed real personal. Far too soon by an unknown and brutal killer still at large. Many of the citizens in the community believed that the small town police squad was ill-equipped and improperly trained for such a large-scale murder investigation, resulting in the stalling of progress in Marine's case. Her sister Lisa recalls that in the confusing and depressing aftermath of her sister's murder, that her family felt cut out of the investigatory process. Feeling helpless, Lisa and Maureen's mother sent a letter to Cedar Rapids Police nearly six months after her eldest daughter's body had been found, in which she detailed important information she believed police were ignoring. She wrote that she believed a man named George Smith was responsible for her daughter's death. Mm. Maureen's mother specified in her letter that George was not a friend of Maureen's, but was known to her due to the proximity of his work to her home, as he was a cashier at a convenience store near Maureen's apartment. While police did interview George Smith during the course of their inquiry in 1971, they did not have enough hard evidence with which to charge him, or any other suspect for that matter, for her murder. In the ensuing decades, Maureen's case grew cold. And while the dead girl's mother insisted that she knew the truth, she could not produce any concrete evidence that would put George behind bars. Hoping that the case was going to be solved simply through allowing time for technology to catch up to the needs of the victim, police again. Yes, definitely. In this case, we're going to need DNA. You're going to need DNA. And it's unfortunate. it was unfortunate they didn't have it back then. This case seems to only be made by DNA. Tested the crime scene evidence in 2009, but to no avail. In the years that passed, Maureen's father would die with no answers to what happened to his eldest daughter. And hoping that that unfortunate fate would not also befall her mother too, in 2013, Maureen's family members created a Facebook page called Remembering Maureen Brubaker Farley, aimed at keeping the case alive in hopes that it would someday be solved. In those ensuing and lonely years, Lisa recalls of her grieving and aging mother, quote, Whenever anybody passed from this world, my mom said, Well, now they're up in heaven with Maureen, and they must be happy, and they must know the answers. But Lisa continued on by providing her own take on the matter, saying, quote, I just didn't want to wait that long. I didn't want us to wait until we go on to the next world. I wanted answers in this world. And on October 5th, 2021, Maureen's family finally got the news that they had been waiting for when police announced that Maureen's mother's hunch had been correct the entire time. Mama knows. Mama knows. Mama knows, bro. Like, like how many times have y'all heard that when growing up? If anybody knows, Mama knows, bro. She hit the nail on the head. The dude, at the cashier dude, who she probably walked past so many times that, that was not too far from where she lived, did it. It's crazy. Investigators had preserved and been able to recreate DNA profile from artifacts left at the crime scene. And after procuring DNA samples from the list of initial suspects, they were able to find a match. Lisa and Maureen's mother had waited for this confirmatory news for half a century. Five decades after Maureen's body was found, the Cedar Rapids Police Department cold case unit was able to conclusively link George M. Smith 
to the crime scene by utilizing DNA technology which was not in existence in the 1970s. Unfortunately, the case was closed without the ability to prosecute as George Smith, never charged nor arrested, was able to peacefully pass away at the ripe old age of 94 in 2013, a luxury not afforded to his teenage victim. That's exactly what I was about to say. He went on to live his life. She couldn't. That's crazy. At least the family did, and I know that don't mean much, but at least they did get some, some closure, but I know that wasn't enough for them. You know, had they had, or, or, probably looked into like the mom did instead of let, allowing six months to pass, you know, maybe they could have found some evidence on them or something, scratch marks or something. But six months later, even if he had a scratch from her, it's probably healed. Six months later, it's nothing to show it. You know what I mean? And they felt like the police department was ill-equipped back then to be able to handle such a case. You remember them saying that? It just, man, it sucks because you know it's many more cases out there back then that were probably like this that fell by the wayside. Maureen. The tragic taking of her sister from her and her family inspired Lisa to eventually join law enforcement mm. in 1991, and she worked her way up to the position of sheriff. Lisa, upon finding out that her mother's suspicions were correct, says, quote, There was so much collateral damage, heartache from Maureen's death. Although her life was just one life, it affected so many for so long. Absolutely. The stress from that probably weighed heavily on, on the father. You know what I mean? They say he passed away. Guaranteed, he was dealing with a lot of stress, thinking about that. You just, it's just a feeling you just can't shake. That's your daughter, that's your child. You know what I mean? Mom never gave up. Sister became a police officer with the motivation of her sister. That's crazy. In late September of 1941, light cruiser HMAS Sydney was operating on the west coast of Australia. She was tasked with escorting convoys from Fremantle to the Sunda Strait in Indonesia. On November 17, 1941, after escorting its most recent troop ship to its destination, Sydney made its return journey to Fremantle. Two days later, on November 19, 1941, at around 4 p.m., the crew of the Sydney spotted what they believed to be a merchant ship on the horizon. As very few merchant ships were allowed in the area at the time, the captain of the Sydney, Joseph Burnett, demanded via signal that the merchant ship identify herself. Uh -oh. The merchant ship identified itself as a Dutch ship, Strat Malacca. However, Strat Malacca was not allowed to be in the area at that time. Uh -oh. The Sydney then sent a signal ordering the ship to show her secret call sign. But despite repeated attempts, the merchant ship did not show the secret call sign. Thinking something was off. This ain't about to be good, bro. This ain't about to be good at all. That gave you opportunity, identify yourself, you did, but you couldn't give the proper information that was needed. It's about to go bad. The captain of the Sydney decided to intercept. The merchant ship was not the Strat Malacca that it had claimed to be. It was actually a disguised and heavily armed German merchant raider ship called the Cormoran. The Cormoran had already sunk 10 ships in the Indian Ocean. As the Sydney drew closer to investigate the ship, the Cormoran opened fire. Although the Sydney was a far superior ship than the merchant ship, the surprise attack caused it to miss its first salvo while the Cormorans hit the Sydney. What followed was a 30-minute battle with both ships mortally damaging each other. Ooh. The Sydney later sank, and almost all of the 645 men on board died in that fight. The crew of the Cormoran, on the other hand, abandoned the ship. 318 of their crew members survived, while only 81 died. Their surviving German crew members were later captured by Australian vessels and became prisoners of war. A search for the sunk vessel found no sign of the ship, except for a single empty life raft, known as a Carly float, and an inflated RAN life jacket. 
A few months later, on February 6, 1942, on the coast of Christmas Island, local authorities found a decomposing body on a Carly float. The broiler suit the man had been wearing was originally blue, but had been bleached white due to the sun. Not much is known about the autopsy results, as most of it was destroyed or lost during the Japanese occupation of Christmas Island. Despite a number of attempts, the body could not be identified, as it had no dog tags nor any items that could help identify him. He was buried in an unmarked grave in Christmas Island's cemetery. In the post-war years, after much speculation that the unidentified man's body had come from the HMAS Sydney, in 2006, the man's body was exhumed and his remains were examined and DNA samples were taken. The man was believed to be between 22 and 31 years old when he died and between 5'6 six and 6'2 six in height. He had died possibly from a fragment of shrapnel being embedded in his skull. In Jeez. Not only was they had to be, you know, because I'm assuming he was from, uh, what's the ship name? The one that sunk, that, that killed everybody. I'm assuming he's from that one. But to be abandoned, have shrapnel in you, and just be out in the middle of the water, bro. That just sucks, man. That ain't the way you want to go out. That ain't the way you want to be. That just, that just sucks all the way around, fam. You know what I mean? And I was just on one of those, um, what's crazy is, I'm gonna have to put some of those videos up. I gotta do a video dump out my phone. But I went to uh, Virginia not too long ago, man, and went to some of those, um, went to the museum there on some of those battleships, bro. Holy, holy cannoli, fam. I've never seen anything quite like those ships, bro. So salute to all uh, the people in the Navy, military, all that type of stuff, man. Like that stuff is just mind blowing to see that stuff up close and personal, how they live on those ships, man, what the inside of those ships look like. You know what I mean? The artillery that's on those ships, man. It's just, if you ever get the opportunity, you know what I mean? Go to Virginia, man, and go to some of those museums and, and on some of those Naval bases, bro. You, you won't be disappointed. He died possibly from a fragment of shrapnel being embedded in his skull. In the next few years, investigators put all resources available into identifying the man. Using dental records, they were able to narrow down the list to 50 members of the HMAS Sydney crew. His DNA would later be submitted to genealogy databases, and on November 19th, 2021, exactly 80 years later, the man was identified as able seaman Thomas Wesley Clark. Thomas was born on January 28th, 1920, in Brisbane, Queensland. His elder brothers served in the Army and in the Air Force. Thomas decided to join the Royal Australian Naval Reserve on August 23rd, 1940. After training at the HMAS St. Giles, he was promoted as acting able seaman in July of 1941. He then went on a further training mission on HMAS Serbius before joining the HMAS Sydney. He was on board the HMAS Sydney for two and a half months before it sank. The HMAS Sydney's wreckage was found in 2008, but no other bodies on board were ever able to be recovered. On June 27, 1992, the dismembered remains of a woman was discovered in a dumpster behind the I Love New York Pizza Restaurant on Midland Avenue in Yonkers, New York, by a construction worker looking for a lost lottery ticket. Her remains were found in plastic bags within the dumpster. Mm. An autopsy revealed that she had died one day prior to her body being found. Both the victim's arms had been severed, along with her right leg, and as a result, the police were unable to administer fingerprints in order to identify- Who does that, bro? Seriously, fam, you gotta dismember? Ah. Ah. Remind me to never be throwing trash away back behind some of these buildings, man. You never know what you can find. And maybe, I know somebody like, yo, L, why are you throwing trash away? Remember, like, before a lot of these places popped up, like these U-Haul places where you can go and buy actual boxes, what did people used to do back in the day when you was moving? You go to somewhere like a, a, a Walmart or, or Kmart or 
a mall. And what would you do? You would go back there to their little dumpster area and you would look for like boxes to move because they would have just like a bin full of nothing but boxes. You go back there. Come on, man. Y'all know you did it. I did it. A lot of people did it because that's the way to get boxes. Nowadays, you go to one of these U-Haul places and buy boxes. You know what I mean? But this dude was back there looking for lottery tickets. But fam, fam, just to come across somebody like that, who would do such a thing? Fire. The victim had a hole in the back of her head from an axe or a similar weapon. Dang. Police were unable to determine if she had been sexually assaulted. The victim had a tattoo of a butterfly on her right shoulder and a scar on her left thigh. She was believed to be a heavy smoker and had cesarean scars, suggesting that she had had at least one child. It was believed that the woman was white or possibly Hispanic. Police believed that the woman was a prostitute and a transient, as she had not been reported missing. Despite a number of attempts, police were unable to identify the victim. It would take police a few years before they linked the case to one Robert Schulman. Robert Schulman was a serial killer who was active from 1991. And a lot of these serial killers do what? They pick on and prey on the women of the night. You know what I mean? All oh, these call girls and different things like that, prostitutes, all that type of stuff, man. This is who they target. To 1996. Schulman was a postal worker who picked up prostitutes in New York City and took them to his apartment in Hicksville, Long Island. He would then smoke crack cocaine with them before bludgeoning them to death. He would then dismember the women's bodies and dispose of their parts throughout Long Island, Manhattan, and Yonkers. Shulman was arrested on April 6, 1996, after a sex worker tipped the police off. Shulman confessed to murdering five women, including the Yonkers Jane Doe. Shulman said that after taking the woman back to his apartment, they both smoked crack cocaine. He says that he then blacked out and woke up to find the Jane Doe dead, after which he dismembered her and dumped her remains in a dumpster in Yonkers. Shulman was sentenced to death in 1999. However, he was resentenced to life in prison. His brother was also sentenced to two years in prison for helping him dispose of one of the bodies. The woman that Shulman murdered included Lori Vasquez, Lisa Ann Warner, Kelly Sue Bunting, as well as two unidentified women, the Yonkers Jane Doe and the Medford Jane Doe. Shulman died in prison in 2006 of an undisclosed cause. Even though Shulman confessed to the murder, he did not remember the names of the victims, and the names of the two unidentified victims remained a mystery. In 2014, Detective John Geis of the Yonkers Cold Case Squad reopened the Yonkers Jane Doe case and asked forensic genealogist and artist Carl Koppelman to make a 3D render of the victim. In 2021, Detective Geis contacted the FBI and the DNA from the victim was entered into genealogy databases nationally. Just three weeks later, the FBI found a potential match to the victim's cousin. Detective Geis then flew to Michigan and met with the victim's possible sister and two brothers. They gave DNA samples and identified the victim from the photo and the butterfly tattoo. A DNA test later confirmed the victim was indeed their missing sister, Marissa Hammonds. On December 7, 2021, Carl Koppelman posted on his Facebook page stating that he had the family's permission to share details about Marissa. Quote, she was born in Kentucky in April of 1961 and was one of seven siblings. She spent much of her early years living in California. When she was older, she moved to Michigan and then to New Jersey, where she and her sister worked as fashion models. Marissa was a mother of two, but estranged from her family at the time of her death. Marissa was identified after 29 years. The Medford Jane Doe remains the only unidentified victim of Robert Schulman. She is described as being 5 foot to 5 one and around 135 pounds, with brown eyes and reddish brown hair, which could have been dyed. She had a tattoo of a red heart with a white banner, which reads Adrian on her left shoulder. If you have any information about Medford Jane Doe, please contact the Suffolk County Medical Examiner's Office at 631-853-5555. Like I said, bro, they all these serial killers, they seem to love to target 
those type of women, bro. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's them trying to justify what they're doing in their mind. Oh, she's doing this. So she's, she's, you know what I mean? They feel like they're scum of the earth or something like that. You know what I mean? So they feel like they're doing it. No, you're not, bro. No, you're not. It's insane, though. Again, at least their family was able to get some type of closure, man. This was, whew. That's rough. That's rough. And uh, he was a postal worker. Now, that may be like, so what, L? My pops is a postal worker, so I'm definitely going to be saying something to him about that, man. Got to be careful around some of y'all postal workers. <laughs> I mean, but nah, y'all get at me in the comment section, man, and let me know what you think. Three decades, old cold cases solved in 2021. Shout outs to all the police departments and investor, uh, investigators who don't give up, man, on these cases, these cold cases, and still pull them and still try to work leads, man, and, and test DNA samples and all that type of stuff like that, man. They, they are the true heroes, for real, for real. It's your boy L, man. Y'all get at me. Let me know what you think. Leave a like, share the video, subscribe, and stick around and stay tuned until the next one. I'm gone. Peace.